What's up, guys? This is Phil Galfon for RunItOnce.com, and today I've uh, dropped all the way down to 25 cent, 50 cent Zoom. I know that a large, a large chunk of our member base um, are regulars at these stakes, and I am hoping that I can, in this, in the short time I have to make a video, gain some insight on the way that the field seems to be playing here and things that I can point out. Uh, obviously, you know we we have some coaches that are regulars in, in, you know, in the smaller stakes games. And I think they would be a little bit more qualified to comment on, you know, the way that the games play and how to beat them at least than, than I would be, you know, right now. But I'm hoping that I can, can uh, learn a little bit about how they play as this session goes on and that I can make some suggestions about how you guys should attempt to combat that. On the left table, as you can see, the flop went three-way. This player, uh, Bold Moves, were the Bold Moves, sir, was the initial raiser I called. This player called. I think he's probably check-folding this river. But And actually, I think I should check because I do fear that people may uh, check-raise a lot here with the nine rather than bet themselves. I just didn't expect to get much value, though I did expect to have the best hand pretty often. So I'm going to ex expect that uh, people in general are going to be a little bit too loose uh, from early position, a little bit too tight from buttons and from the blinds, uh, as I find that that's the case in uh, in a lot of games. Obviously, we'll see some open limping. Is this a hand I want to isolate with? Actually, it's not. Uh, actually, fine. It's uh, it's not a hand I want to put a lot of money in with and have a pot go multi-way. But I think that uh, I do want to isolate against a player who has limped. Um, and, you know, given that it's a heads-up pot, there's a good chance that I take it down post-flop or that I end up, you know, getting to pot control and, and see a cheap showdown with my kings. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bet this flop uh, kind of for showdown reasons. I don't think uh, I have to fear a ton of check raises, and I am comfortable check folding there with... Uh, or sorry, I'm fo comfortable folding to a raise. I'm going to bet this turn with the second nut blocker. Uh, I think that we will uh, get a raise from the nut flush here very often. So because of that, uh, I, I can be confident he doesn't have the nuts and pretty confident that, or <laughs> pretty confident he doesn't have the nuts, very confident that he doesn't have the second nuts, given that I block it. Um, and so it actually becomes a very good blocker, um, sometimes better than the nut blocker. Uh, in certain situations. Rare, but certain, sometimes. Uh, his call on the turn seemed a little bit weak, uh, given the speed of it as well. Um, but unfortunately, he, he does have the third nuts and, and calls there. Uh, but I do like the way that I played that hand. I think we get a lot of turn calls and river folds there, which, you know, you shouldn't be betting the turn if you expect to be called always, um, even if you think you get enough river folds to, to make the river bet profitable. But uh, I think that I expected a lot of turn folds as well as river folds. I will try to remember if we see a somewhat interesting hand developing that we're not involved in to stick around and see how it plays out. Ace eight four deuce double suited is pretty weak. I'm actually going to go ahead and peel on the button. I'm not expecting to get squeezed super often. I think that if you're not getting squeezed very often, which I imagine is is the case in these games, you can get away with a lot more um, in-position peels than I, I would assume that you think you can. Playing at uh, even even 100 big blinds, uh, more so when stacks are deeper, and I mean it becomes a much bigger deal then. I'm going to call here with ace, queen, 10, 9. I think that getting a multi-way pot, this is a hand that plays well multi-way. It also doesn't play well against a 4-bet uh, if this guy raises and 4-bets, and, uh, so... I would rather keep the limper in and, and play it that way. What I was getting to is that if my assumptions are right that people are not squeezing very often and just not three betting in general, you should be playing extremely loose from your buttons, both uh, when it's folded to you and when it's raised to you. Obviously, I'm not going to call here, but I do want to see what happens. Uh, both of these hands post flop are very standard. This guy. Limp called with uh, low rundown. So I'd be taking notes like that to get a good feel for his limp call range. Obviously, uh, I'm not going to be playing 
uh, thousands of hands with him, but uh, we may see him pop up one or two more times, and even though we can't uh, get a great feel for his ranges by the end of this video, it's still worthwhile to uh, to talk about how we go about uh, doing that. Uh, normally I would fold this hand from the small blind. I'm going to go ahead and raise, assuming that the average player here will overfold the big blind. Uh, the big blind should not fold very often there. King 957, how do I want to play this? Well, I want to time out and fold, which is not what I wanted to do. I didn't realize that I would time out there. I thought I had some time bank. I was going to 3-bet. I think that calling is kind of the standard play there, but I have a feeling people will play weak out of position against 3-bets, although I feel like I recognize that name as potential regular. But still, basically I guess what I'm getting at thus far in the video is that position is extremely powerful if players are going to be playing improperly, and, and in general that's going to mean too weak. I'm going to check this flop back. I have a uh, a little bit of equity against, you know, his non-flushes, or a decent amount of equity against his non-flushes, and I think that I can also make hands fold later. Uh, I'm going to start right now uh, betting this turn. Uh, I think that, you know, he may have some hands that call flop, but call, would have called flop, but will we'll fold the turn. More importantly, I guess what I'm getting at is that if he had some kind of slow plays on the flop, I'm going to check this down. If he had some kind of slow plays on the flop, I would have expected uh, him to bet the turn pretty often with them, so we can be confident we're facing a weaker range um, in that situation on the turn, so our turn bet gets more folds and prevents us from putting in money on the flop uh, in a situation where you know he can still have the top of his range pretty often. And uh, the hands that we fold out, we actually have pretty decent equity against. So not an important hand, but the one that just played out over here, uh, 447. I imagine that you're going to be getting a lot of that. People limp calling and just folding on boards like this way too often. And while you can't really make a post-flop adjustment to that, because your post-flop adjustment is to just see bet like you already were, uh, you can make a pre-flop adjustment, which is to get into as many pots as you possibly can with the weak type players. And I've always kind of kind of emphasize, and I, th I think it's very important, if you're going to be playing in a game type, or you're playing at stakes where there are a lot of weaker players, and I know that 25 cent, 50 cent has gotten tougher, and I also know that uh, I'm not I'm not qualified to make comments on, you know, the strength of the player pool, but I think it's pretty fair to assume that, um, that you're going to run into a fair amount of recreational players compared to at higher stakes. Um, and when you are in games with a lot of recreational players, Making sure you play pots with them uh, is really the name of the game. I wouldn't say that you should... I mean, if you're bankrolled, I would never tell you to you know, avoid spots, uh, tough spots against regulars, but you definitely do want to be getting in pots with weaker hands than you're used to against the uh, recreational players. Consider uh, four-betting this to, f to kind of find out if he has aces. I know that sounds weird, but uh, I think we're just a little bit uh, shallow for that. If we had about 80, or sorry, um, yeah, $80, which is 160 big blinds, uh, I probably would have four bet um, as, you know, I can happily call against a... How do I want to play this? I can happily call against a five bet, yet um, I get to more credibly rep I'm going to bet for protection on the right. I think it's uh, kind of questionable. And I'm just going to fold on the left table. What I was getting to is that I, I feel as though for betting there, pre-flop uh, with the deeper stacks, there's not a real big downside. And then I get to rep the... This I can probably get away with um, if people are overfolding. Then I get to rep the, you know, ace-ace hands. He's going to be very credible. He's going to give me a lot of credit for ace-ace, king-king, and I'm going to get to take the pot down a lot on those boards. Um, as well as, you know, I have a pretty playable hand, so there's not a ton of downside. Uh, very loose open. I would not make this uh, open in a tough game, but if people are going to be folding as much as I expect, you can get away probably with near 100% button raise. I would I would fold your, your trips hands and... Uh, unless they're trip kings or trip aces, and otherwise just go ahead and raise, uh, unless you have some regulars playing very tough. I'm going to make a loose peel here. I don't think it's fantastic, but given that it's a five-way pot, 
And another mistake that uh, I expect a lot of weaker players to make is to put too much money in uh, with the second best hand. So seeing a flop with a hand that can potentially flop very well, uh, I don't think uh, can be too bad. But I think it's probably a fold preflop. Um, I see about this flop uh, just for my immediate fold equity. Check, check on the turn. I don't think I have enough turn fold equity or enough equity to make this turn bet. Now that he bets the river, uh, I'm actually going to fold my flush. I don't see how... I don't see how... He has many hands that he can turn into bluffs here. It basically would have to be 4-5 um, or 7-6-5, something like that. But a lot of those end up hitting something anyways. Uh, so I am just going to go ahead and fold, even even though my you know absolute hand strength looked kind of strong. Uh, I'm going to isolate with this hand. Uh, like I said, I, I want to isolate people that are limping. Not specifically people that are limping, but I want to isolate players that are recreational. And I'm going to make the assumption, given that I don't have any other information to go on, that I can, that I can, I'm going to make the assumption, excuse me, I'm having trouble talking. Uh, I'm going to make the assumption that the players that limp are weaker players. If you were paying attention just now, you'll notice that I did something uh, very exploitable. On the left table with a weak hand, I made a smaller raise to isolate. And on the right table with double suited ace, I made a larger raise. And I think you can get away with that. Uh, at least at first, you know, some of the regulars eventually might take advantage of it. When he check calls 6-4 deuce hard heart, I actually think he has a ton of flushes, and I'm not not going to plan on bluffing anymore, especially with no blockers in my hand. But what I was saying is you can get away, especially against weaker players, with uh, making kind of more obvious exploitable bet sizes, put in more money with your stronger hands and less money with your weaker hands in spots where they're likely to treat the bets as, as the same. And I guess the point that I'm getting to or the point that's coming up in various ways is that I would just take every possible angle to exploit the players that are not very tough. And that includes, that includes, I mean, it basically involves making yourself very exploitable. So if they knew what you were doing, they would be able to, uh, to beat up on you pretty well. But if you can be confident that somebody is is not strong enough a player to know what you're doing, I think then uh, you're leaving a lot of money on the table if you uh, don't start playing very exploitive, uh, exploitatively and exploitably. Ace King Jack three here. I'm just going to go ahead and call. It's uh, questionable, uh, and you could even consider raising. I'm going to raise on the left. No, I'm going to call on the left table here. I, I would be very happy to see a multi-way pot with this hand, and I would. I don't think it plays super great in position to 3-bet in that, you know, when I hit my ace-jack, he's not going to put much money in because I'm repping aces. Uh, I have to give this dude a smiley. That was funny. I am going to go ahead and call this flop. I'm assuming that he's a regular because good players can make better jokes. And uh, on the right table, it goes check-check on the flop. I'm going to check this turn back on the left table. I do think I have, uh, I do think he's going to play pretty honest against me here, but there are not many hands that I need to fold out here. Let him take his equity with whatever he has and, and not risk the check raise. I guess I'll go ahead and fold and, and not waste more time, but I'm, I think he's kind of weak uh, in this spot. Hmm. Should I value bet here? I think that, um, where's he from? Canadians are too honest, man. No, I think uh, we can ignore his comment and play the hand on its merits. I think it's pretty close here. I think you can go either way. Uh, his comments actually make me want to fold a little bit more. Although his second comment made me not want to. Anyways, uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, and as you can tell, I'm focusing a little bit more on on overall strategy than the specific hands. Here, uh, I don't really see how we're beat. It would have to be 3-4 specifically. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and bet. I don't think that I need to make it too big because um, he's very capped at like ace-ace. And if I want to keep... Well, I guess that you can make an argument then for making it big and uh, making your bet big and bluffing a lot. Uh, which also works, but that's that's more game theory based. I think in practice, I'm going to get called more often when I make a smaller bet there. 
okay flop. I'm going to go ahead and lead. And you can consider this, uh, well, not in this spot. It's a, in a, in a multi-way pot, sometimes you can get away with a very small lead to thin the field. And it's kind of a, what I would consider a trick. Um, and, and in general, I don't like to teach tricks in videos. I like to teach ways of thinking. But it, it's something that's going to work against weaker players, certainly. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and barrel through here now that I pick up the flush draw and the blockers. On the three, I'm a little discouraged now from bluffing. His aces or kings look a lot better now, which he definitely can have a lot of. Um, more importantly, you know, if he has a hand like 9-7 or 6-7-8, I now beat that hand, so I don't need to bluff. Um, so I think the, the range that I'm trying to bluff him off of doesn't fold enough uh, like that. For instance, on the right table, I'm going to peel with the top pair and a bunch of backdoor stuff. Interesting turn uh, that it completes one of the straight draws, but gives us a very strong hand. I'm trying to think about his flop leading range. I think he's going to have a lot of uh, potential nut flushes or nut flush draws on flop or uh, two pair type hands. Either way, uh, I'd like to put some more money into this pot. And uh, so I'll go ahead and bet. You know, top two pair alone isn't very strong in this situation, but given that I have all the redraws that I do have, uh, it becomes a hand that, you know, I'm happy to put money in with. Three bet on the left table. Double pairs are great for deceptive purposes uh, post flop. And facing a four bet, and given these stacks, I, I feel comfortable calling for nine more, but I'm not very happy about it. And unfortunately, it's a pretty terrible flop. I'm going to go ahead and fold this river. I don't see, I mean, you have, hmm, he'd have to have like ace, deuce, four. He's repping a kind of weaker flush, potentially, or he could have a strong flush and, and want me to to bluff somehow. But there are just not enough missed draws. He has too much showdown value there for me to consider uh, bluff catching. So I think uh, a lot of your value in these games, well, I guess there are two, there are two types of weaker players. Um, obviously, there are a thousand types, uh, really, if you want to get more specific. But um, if you want to divide them into two categories, uh, one being the ones who overfold and are a little too weak, I'm actually going to make a questionable play here in 3-bet this hand. Uh, I think that, you know, we are an equity dog to the majority of his range, but I don't feel comfortable calling. And I do think we have a little bit of pre-flop fold equity. More importantly, I think that on a paired board, we have a lot of post-flop fold equity. Uh, so I think that even though we're building a big pot and there's not much stack left behind to give us room to maneuver, I think there are a lot of flops on which we can go ahead and just jam and he'll fold. This is a really ugly spot, but I think that given I was the three better, I have to jam. And, you know, I do run into ASAX, but oftentimes, yeah. And people can uh, make some incorrect folds against my hand and definitely even against my range in situations where there's one pot size bet left. And especially in situations where there's like a half pot size bet left, I think people um, very greatly underestimate their equity with a lot of uh, very weak hands. So you, you get them to make some big mistakes in that sense. Back to talking about the two uh, types of players. Uh, weaker players. I think a lot of weaker players are going to be too tight, both you know in terms of pre-flop and post-flop stealing, defending against small bet sizes. I think that playing around with a lot of small bet sizes can get you uh, can get you very far with uh, in those situations where it's like button versus blinds, where people have weaker ranges in general. I'm going to peel here, but I'm not very happy about the situation, given that his range uh, is likely to dominate mine. Uh, or portions of his range dominate my hand. I'm not going to put any more money in here unless something happens. But yeah, I think you can get away with a lot of smaller bet sizes. People who are less skilled aren't going to look at a hand like mid-pair backdoor flush draw and uh, on a somewhat scary board, and now that they're facing a small bet, think it's good. Or like bottom pair or no pair with a bunch of backdoor draws. Um, so getting away with smaller bet sizes is, is a good way to take advantage of the fact that people will overfold in a lot of those spots. There's also the type of player that uh, plays too many hands. I have a very easy value bet here on the right. I didn't feel like I could go for two streets um, starting on the turn, but perhaps I could have. Um, a little bit questionable for me to check, have checked there. 
the players that are too loose um, and put too much money in post-flop is something that a lot of people struggle with, uh, the proper way to adjust to them, because when you see somebody at your table that's um, just spewing a ton of chips off, um, they're playing a lot of hands pre-flop, and they're not folding much post-flop, they're putting in way too much money with, you know, top pair and a gutter, um, they're just ready to stack off with any kind of piece of the board. A lot of people feel as though they need to get in pots with them, which is true, but what happens is they end up playing a lot of weak hands in order to get into pots with them. And unfortunately, when you get involved with a lot of weak hands, you're not going to flop hands very often that you want to put 100 big blinds plus in with. So the fact that they're ready to go with a lot of their, uh, with a lot of their range uh, post-flop doesn't really help you. Um, because first you need to flop a very big hand. So the actual way to combat uh, players who are just way too loose and spewy at a six-handed table is actually just to play reasonable and play tight because um, the way you're going to beat them, you can, you know, you can definitely, you know, adjust post-flop and you want to try to get in more pots with them, sure. But if you try to over-adjust to get into pots with them, you're going to, you're going to hurt yourself. So I would continue, I would just, uh, Continue to play your preflop game. Maybe play a little bit tighter, depending on you know if they're if they have immediate position on you, and you have some uh, some hands that are that look like good late position steals, but are pretty weak. I would go ahead and fold those. Um, here, I guess standard is to fold. I kind of don't believe him, but and I do think I do think I could get some credit with a raise, but uh, I'm talking about something, and I I think standard is just to fold there. Uh, anyways. Um, yeah, if, if you have a Maniac to your left, uh, it's definitely good to tighten up even a little bit more than uh, your regular game. Um, but I guess the, the main thing that will caution you against is making a mistake that a lot of people make, which is to just play any hand to get involved in a pot with him and 3-bet with some weak hands because you want to isolate him and get in the pot with him. Uh, if he's going to just put too much money in post-flop and never fold, I think Trip Queens, I can't. I can't defend here for one bet. Uh, if he's going to put a lot of money in and, and rarely fold, you lose a lot of your bluffing equity with, with your weaker hands, which, you know, in a, in a stealing situation where you're late position and somebody's defending the blind, you know, reasonably well and wide, then a lot of your advantage having the initiative, which I think is overrated, but I'll talk about that another time. Having the initiative, having position, um, and... I mean, I guess that's actually it. Comes from the fact that you get to bluff uh, when they show weakness. And you can't really get away with playing uh, playing weak hands against players who are not folding, even, even if they're making a lot of mistakes by getting it in bad. I'm going to isolate here. It's pretty thin. My hand's not very good, but I feel somewhat confident that that he's not going to be a strong player, given that he's limping. And on this board, I think that uh, doing anything other than betting through is a mistake. Uh, there are a lot of like pair plus gutter or two pair hands that he can have in his range. You'll notice I limp called with queens on the right table. I think it just plays a little bit better than uh, raising because you do have to fold do a three bet. Um, with top set, I'm just going to check call. I don't think there's a much reason to do anything else. I'm going to check call twice and then figure it out. You could argue for uh, leading this turn as a bluff or potentially check raising as a bluff uh, or a semi bluff rather. But I think that uh, I think the checking is probably best. He's given me such good odds that I do have to peel again. Um, I almost definitely don't have the best hand right now, but I have uh, nine outs and a little bit of implied odds, and he's giving me uh, three to one basically immediate. So I'm going to take it. Um, river bricks, and I'm just going to check fold, and I don't think there's a whole lot to, to talk about there. Left table, top pair, top kicker, low flush draw. It's, you know, two mediocre hands. It's kind of handy. You just want to get to showdown or, you know, uh, potentially if he, if he checks, you want to bet and, uh, you know, hope that, uh, hope that your draw is good or hope that your, your main hand is good and, and hope that you just take the pot in now, pot down now, but you have some backup just in case you don't. And, you know, even if I have the best made hand and the best draw, there's nothing wrong with getting to fold a hand like King 10, 7, 6, uh, because that has a lot of equity or a reasonable amount of equity against my hand. And, uh, there's some money in the pot and, uh, why let him have a free card? 
And I think that in that situation, it's, it's a situation where he often has a weak hand, given that he's checked the turn. If let's say he was in position and he had called a C bet, it would be, it would be a little bit different. I still would bet a hand like this, but um, what would be different is that betting to just take the pot down against hands that you beat uh, but have a little bit of equity becomes less attractive when his range is less capped because you more often run into hands that can call a raise. Whereas once he's checked, I think uh, he has a lot of hands that are folding um, and very few hands that are check raising. So I think you uh, can get away with that bet a lot more once they have let you know that they're, you know, relatively capped or a big chunk of their range is weak. Probably slightly too loose here to open with the 10, 8, 6, 4. I would need to, to open this, I need to be a little bit more confident in the fact that people are, are too tight and I would need to see some stats, which I, as you can see, I've still not set up uh, to work for Zoom. I'm not going to stab on the right table and on the left table, this is a little bit too weak to, to play. I do think um, another interesting dynamic that's going to come up in these games is that the other regulars are going to be isolating. And um, it's definitely an interesting game of fighting for, you know, a, a recreational player puts in 50 cents and then uh, two tough players put in, you know, $50 trying to fight for that 50 cents and the right to play with him or... Um, and it, it's kind of the same thing as, as blinds, you know, blinds are pretty small, but we're all fighting for them and it ends up, uh, building some big pots. I don't know why I, op I think he was sitting out or I at least thought he was sitting out, which is why I opened this hand. It's still a questionable open and uh, I don't really like it. I'm going to raise on the left table. I think it plays a little bit better than calling, um, with my weak open ender. And I do think I just have enough fold equity on a board like this. People see that, um, as the raiser very often. And they just very often don't have much. So getting getting a bet in there works out very well. On the right, I've turned uh, week two pair. I'm tempted to bet to protect my hand, but I also don't really think... Uh, I mean, he's never folding a better hand. And he does have some better hands. Now, I still think betting to protect and this, you know, somewhat of a semi-bluff uh, works out pretty well. Once I get called in both of these spots, I'm actually just going to give up. I don't think... Um, I mean, on the right table, my hand's no good, and I don't think, you know, I have no blockers, so I'm not really confident in bluffing. I'm very surprised that I had the best hand there. Uh, on the left table, there's no good reason. Well, there I shouldn't say there's no good reason to bet, but I think that I'm in bad shape too often. Here he had a king and made a pretty loose call in the turn, um, although he had equity against my hand. Uh, I'm going to check here. And, you know, that was one of the hands that potentially could fold, but I actually think he might uh, hero call there when the when the ace pairs as well. And once we've checked back the turn, we've uh, let him know that we probably don't have a six anymore. So that means we had a bluff. And even though we can have some ace-x hands, I think we don't have enough that uh, we can get away with the river bet, not to mention that he can have ace-x himself. I'm surprised how many people uh, are talking to me. All right, let's, uh, let's focus a little more on the poker uh, rather than uh, overall concepts, and hopefully I can learn some things about, uh, about the player pool rather than make some assumptions. So we have a limp, we have an ISO. Uh, I have a hand that would just love to see a flop. Hands like this do not actually play extremely well in multi-way three-bet squeeze pots. I think people way overvalue them when they're single-suited. Even double-suited, they get overvalued. You just very often flop. I mean, obviously, you flop like this and you have nothing, but you flop a lot of, you know, losing two pair hands or pair plus weak flush draw hands. They play very well in a heads-up pot, especially when somebody can be stealing, and so you have some you actually have, you know, a big playability advantage. But against a tight range, I don't think people are gaining as much as they think they are by three-betting those uh, single-suited rundowns. And certainly in multi-way pots, I think you're just going to get yourself in trouble. Uh, you really want to be playing very strong hands in multi-way pots. Um, strong hands, even like this with the four dangler, obviously the four dangler is bad. I'm going to make a loose ISO on the right table. I'm going to three-bet this hand 
because I think uh, he's probably opening the button relatively wide and has, you know, it's got a decent amount of playability. Interesting flop. Um, definitely, you know, I definitely have a good enough hand to raise call. However, I'm trying to think how I can get money in good here. And, you know, I would think about checking, I th but I, I just think uh, my I hit this board too hard with my range, so he's not going to fall for it. Um, I said I decided to bet small to let him peel with some weaker dominated draws or dominated pairs. ISO didn't work. I got cold called, um, but I flop a flush draw, which I am going to go ahead and bet. I, I think you just get a ton of folds on 994, um, so why not just go ahead and stab and you have a little backup equity. If a lot of pots are going multi-way, it's interesting because you kind of, this kind of turns into two games. Uh, the late game, where it's folded to the button, or small blind, um, where I think you should actually adjust by playing more loose than, than you likely are. And then the early game, where if you are at a table where people are v-pipping very often and, and playing too loose aggressive, um, or at least too loose against early position raises, which was one of my assumptions, then you actually want to play very tight in those situations. And when the pot has gone raise, call, call, or limp, raise, call, you want to be playing pretty tight uh, as well. I think it's just important to think about how to best take advantage of the leaks that people are making. I mean, to say that's important is a pretty big understatement. It's kind of been a huge part of what what I think has uh, has helped me as a poker player and, and uh, has set me apart. And what it comes down to is, you know, step one, which is very important, is identifying the uh, tendencies of your opponents and potentially leaks they're making. These are both pretty loose opens in the cutoff. I think at a tough table, you probably can't get away with them or certainly can't get away with them. I'm not even sure if I'm getting away with them in this situation, but I do think I can definitely bet this flop. Uh, it's a situation where I'd be less likely to bet the flop in a tougher game because I, I know that I don't rep much, but it's just a board on which nobody has anything. So I think I just get a lot of immediate fold equity if, if people aren't going to be too bluff happy. Four is not a great card. I'm trying to think what he's check calling me with after calling in the big blind. I do turn some equity. I'm actually just going to go ahead and check. I don't think that, I don't think he's folding the turn often enough. I think he's turned two pair or he flopped two pair. Or he has a set or he turned a straight uh, most of the time. Very weird uh, way that the hands played out. I'm just going to call with my nine high flush. I don't think uh, there's anything else to do, but he ends up betting a three pair there. And while I didn't make any adjustments, I mean, I didn't know that he... I still don't know if he's a weaker player or a stronger player. I think that bet is bad on the river. But mistakes like that uh, are the kind that just kind of punish themselves. Um, he's value betting in a spot where he's not going to get any value. And because of that, I mean, that's just something that does does encourage you to play more pots because you want to play against the players that are making mistakes like that uh, more often. And, you know, it makes all of your hands overall more profitable. But at the same time, you need to catch some hands so that you can uh, catch him value betting too light um, or whatever other leaks he may make. So I'm just going to check this down. I think check calling the flop would have been an option too, uh, rather than betting. Interesting that I that I showed down a winner there. I guess he had like queens with clubs or queen jack with clubs. Oh no, just the... I'm surprised he didn't turn that into a bluff at some point. But um, not super shocked, but a little bit surprised. But yeah, so uh, we've talked about how to adjust to people under defending, which is pretty obvious. We've talked to about how to adjust to the hyper lag at your table, at your six max table. And even if he's not crazy post flop, or sorry, pre flop, if he's crazy post flop, um, you still need to play tight because you need hands that you can go with. Uh, what, what other kind of players are there other than regulars? I mean, they're the players that are very honest 
which I guess you can still categorize as weak tight, but not just weak, uh, not just tight preflop, but just weak tight overall. And those are guys you can definitely get involved in pots with with weak hands because they're just gonna play very fit or fold. And if they don't flop anything, you get to take on the pot. If you flop something marginal, they're not gonna apply a lot of pressure, so you're gonna get to show it down and realize your equity, which is actually a huge part of uh, of um, encouraging you to play weak hands. I think that. If people are allowing you to realize your equity with weaker hands, PLO equities run so close that uh, you get to get away with playing a lot more of those weaker hands. But as people get more aggressive and don't let you realize your equity with those hands, then you need to be playing better hands, kind of for obvious reasons. Am I going to bet this turn? Yes, but uh, I'm not super excited about it. I actually think there are a lot of kings in his range, which is unfortunate. Kings meaning king-king um, in his small blind cold calling range. But, you know, he also has a lot of 9x, and uh, I have a lot of immediate fold equity, as well as, you know, my equity in the hand with my two pair outs, my uh, gutter, and my not flush draw outs. I also want to build a pot against uh, another flush draw there. Probably too loose of an open here with ace-queen, 10-5, suited to the queen. Suited to the ace, I would play it. Um, it just plays better in a multi-way pot that way. If you're up against somebody who's playing a reasonable range, a uh, reasonable stealing range in late position, but is pretty fit or fold uh, or straightforward post-flop, you get to defend quite a bit in the big blind. Um, a hand like this that I have on the button, king three, deuce deuce with king I suit, uh, is definitely a hand I would defend against a 2.5x raise um, against the player who's going to play pretty, play pretty fit or fold. <sighs> Ace-king 6-6 six, six is the exact kind of hand you don't want to be building pots with. So even though I like to isolate, I actually am just going to limp and let this go multi-way. This hand plays pretty decently multi-way um, because, you know, hitting a six or hitting your flush draw or flush, um, you have a very big hand that you can put a lot of money in with against anybody. Um, but in a heads-up pot, especially isolating where he's going to put me on ace-king xx or ace-ace and king-king, this hand just doesn't get a lot of value. I went ahead and bet the flop on the right table, which is somewhat questionable, but I wanted to thin the field, and even if I get check called by um, by a better hand, I have a little bit of equity um, and some backdoor draws, and at this point I'm just going to give up and, and check down and fold to any action. He can't really have any bluffs here. He would have to be... I think I have the best hand here on the left table, but I still don't see a very good reason to bet. It's basically to protect against a flush draw or to get a little bit of value from ace-queen, but I think the risk of somebody check-raising is too great there. And uh, I'm actually going to fold facing a bet uh, here because I, I just think he's very likely to do him in check-raising. I don't think it's a spot that people bluff very often, and I don't think he's going to be value betting worse. So I'd be happy to take in the comments section here questions uh, in the form of this is a player's tendencies, how do I take advantage of it? Um, or this is a mistake that I think my opponent's making, but how do I take advantage of it? And I would encourage you guys to answer each other. But in addition to that, I think that just thinking about, thinking about things like that is going to help you a lot in your poker game, kind of figuring it out on your own. And it's not always as simple as uh, as you may think. There are easy ones like folds often in the big blind, so I can steal more from the button than the small blind. But there, are, even with one as simple as that, there are other adjustments to take into account. Uh, for example, if he's folding a lot in the big blind, then when he calls, his range is tighter than it otherwise would be. His range is tighter than, than most people's ranges would be there. So you have to give him more credit post-flop. And especially since you're stealing with a weaker range, I'm actually just going to fold this uh, garbage against the 3-bet. Given that you're opening a weaker range to take advantage of his tight pre-flop folding, you're going to have to drop your C-bet stat tremendously because your range is going to be weaker and his range is going to be stronger and you just can't get away with making a strong range fold quite as often. I'm um, picking up the blocker and the gutter um, as well as my over pair which gives me some equity against two pair. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and fire here. I think it's questionable, sure, but I do think he has a lot of king king, queen queen with hearts or ace xx with nut hearts type hands that I can just make fold immediately. Left table, I'm actually going to check back with uh, 
a hand that you know is often good and you know has good equity when when not good but doesn't want to build a big pot and uh, it's nice to be able to do some bluffs and and you know very happily call them it is kind of obvious if he's a good player that uh, I have some showdown value here do I want to bet the turn to just take it down I think no I don't fear a ton of check raises, I guess, but I do fear some. And I just think that, you know, with my wrap in addition to my top pair, I just have a lot of equity against a range that is going to contain a lot of these cards that are in my hand as well. So let's just check it down and take the showdown. He didn't have much equity at all with that hand. And I think avoiding the risk of getting check raised uh, at the potential cost of letting that letting hands like that draw, I think is well worth it. Loosish open on the left table. Again, if you're in a loose aggressive tough game, then I definitely would not suggest opening this hand. Flop a pretty nice wrap. Not the nut wrap, uh, so he could be dominated, but a nice wrap with two backdoor flush draws, and I'm going to go ahead and bet. I think check raising is an option. I don't really love check calling. I think it's uh, a waste of a good hand. And I am going to bet this turn when I turn a flush draw. Uh, I do think I get called a lot, but I also just have so much equity that I don't really mind. And I'm going to call this three bet, but I'm not happy about it. I suddenly got a little bit happier. Very easy bet on the left table. I think that checking would be a mistake against a range that I assume contains a lot of overpairs, even when he does check. Uh, on the right table, I'm going to call and take my equity, although there is a very decent chance that he has a, a boat and I'm drawing dead. But given the pot odds he gave me, I just have too much equity overall. Uh, he does check raise probably with an overpair or with uh, the case 10 and something else. Ace, ace, deuce, maybe? And I kind of hope he wins, because he wished me good luck. Okay, so he had the low wrap, and that makes sense. I think his three bet is... Uh, I think his three bet is bad. Um, it's the kind of hand that is nice and deceptive against a wide button opening range. I would, I would like to three bet it, but against a tough player, who I assume he thinks I'm a tough player, uh, opening under the gun, I think that it's just a, a pure spew. And uh, I don't really see any good reason to uh, to make a 3-bet like that. Um, I don't 3-bet I don't, uh, even 200 big blinds deep with a hand like this that, uh, you know, looks like it hits the flops. It, it, it hits flops that my 3-bet range hits. Um, so there's no deception in a 3-bet there. And it doesn't do great against... Uh, it does pretty poorly against a 4-bet, and uh, just against an under-the-gun range in general, it's not really killing it. So two easy calls, flop and turn. If he checks the turn, I am going to bet, um, which you'll notice is kind of a theme in these games. I think that when people give me the go-ahead, I am going to bet until they kind of prove otherwise, um, prove that I should do otherwise. Uh, he pots it, which I'm not sure what to make uh, of. It often means, uh, well, it means all kinds of things. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it means uh, draws, which makes me a little bit less happy than I otherwise would be to hit my queen high flush. Also, unfortunately, the six, uh, it's a six of diamonds rather than a brick diamond, so there are not many hands in my range that have missed. I do definitely fear the check raise here, but more importantly, I, I don't think I'm getting called even by a set, so I'm going to go ahead and check back. Um, I also block straight draws with my 9-9. Nine, nine. He did end up having the straight. And I was somewhat right in that he had a draw. But, uh, oh, he had a draw and a made hand. But anyways, I, I don't think that I get a ton of value in that spot. If he is a weaker player, he would have paid me off with that. But I, I've seen him pop up a few times, so he might be multi-tabling this. I think he's pretty likely not to be a weaker player. So I feel pretty... I feel confident that he that he could have laid a hand like that down um, if he did some hand reading and realized that I can't have any air. Uh, I would have had to have turned like uh, Queen Jack Nine into a bluff there, which I would turn Queen Jack Nine into a bluff there for what it's worth against uh, tougher players. This guy isolates against an again limper. I'm going to come along. This is not a hand that I really love three betting, but it plays fine in a multi-way pot. This guy is opened in the cutoff i'm going to make a loose peel i don't mind three betting this hand if we were a little bit deeper meanwhile on the right table i flop two pair but in a multi-way pot where people behind me can still have flushes i'm just going to go ahead and fold 
Obviously a good flop for me on the left. I'm surprised to see the preflop raiser check. I'm a little bit tempted to check behind, but I'm not comfortable raising turns if I do that. So I'm just going to bet, bet, bet. And if somebody raises, I'm going to make a decision. But this is a board that ranges hit so hard. So I'm expecting to get a flop call very often. Not a great turn for me, but I do think there's still enough ace-10, ace-jack type hands that can call that I should try to get my value now. I don't feel very great about getting my value on the river if it goes check-check because he can still check-raise the river. Um, and more importantly, uh, I think my line looks somewhat credible in that spot. Ace hitting is uh, very bad for me. I think that he was very likely to have aces up. Uh, in fact, so likely that this is a very easy fold, in my opinion. I don't really see what else he can have other than a boat here. So, uh, I mean, if he if he's somehow bad, he can have a weirdly played straight that he just doesn't know what he's doing. But I, I think uh, it's a much better chance that he knows what he's doing and he has a boat. So I'm going to go ahead and fold my boat. So I know I was kind of all over the place uh, during this video. But there were a lot of things that I, I did set out when I started this session to figure out some things about the player pool. And I pretty quickly realized that I wasn't going to figure them out in, in the span of this video. So I made some assumptions and I, and I talked about that. And, and hopefully you guys found some value in that. I do think there, there is a lot of value in, uh, in the type of adjustments I'm talking about. And uh, the reason I gave you a few different ways to, uh, or a few different types of players to exploit and how to exploit them is because I'm not really sure what types of players you're going to encounter here and I want to prepare you for all of them. On the right table, uh, I'm not really sure that his bet makes a ton of sense, but actually I'm going to go ahead and call. I was very tempted to raise because I, I just doesn't make a ton of sense. Okay, so the King King 2-3. But an under the gun range doesn't do great against a, uh, or sorry, uh, on a board like that. He's not hitting a lot of straights with an under the gun opening range, which is very high card heavy. So I didn't feel like he had much on the turn, but he did have uh, kings with the low straight. And my turn call ended up being uh, pretty poor. I bet the flop and decided to check call the turn. I wish I had a little more time there. The reason I check called the turn is that I felt as though I didn't have a hand I could value bet twice. So rather than bet the turn and turn my hand face up on brick rivers by checking, I think checking the turn and checking most rivers to him uh, works out nicely in that uh, he doesn't know what type of range that I have on, on bricks and on various, you know, on various rivers that I do hit. The reason I fold this river is I have uh, blockers to the straight draws with my king jack eight. Um, and also I have no blockers to hearts. So whether he backdoored hearts or had a thin value bet type hand, I don't know. I, I don't know if he's gonna value bet that many hands on the heart river, but I do still think he doesn't have enough bluffs uh, given my blockers. And um, if he did have straight draws, given that my straight draw blockers are non hearts, then he, then he was somewhat likely to have hearts to go along with them. I will limp behind here on the left table if uh, if given the opportunity, just strictly for my nut flush draw potential in my position. Um, and there you go. So in a five-way pot, bottom pair with nut flush draw is not as good because when, I mean, for obvious reasons, but when you start building a pot, your two pair outs are no longer good, um, at least a, a good chunk of the time. Whereas in a heads-up pot, you know, if I were to get it in here against kings with hearts, um, still in pretty good shape, or kings without hearts, or kings with a gutter, then I'm in pretty great shape. A uh, very easy call here. I'd much rather invite multi-way action than, you know, get in another $25 uh, behind. Uh, interesting turn there with the, the deuce of hearts. Uh, right table, I'm just going to check down uh, if he had an ace, now he has two pair. If he had a 10, now he has trips, and I think he had one of those hands. So um, given that he checked the river, I think he's more likely to have an ace, and I actually feel like there's a chance I could get him to fold. Um, you could say that my jack blocker comes in handy, but uh, it's not really part of the equation. I just think he has an ace and he's folding. Um, and if he, again, I don't know if he's a strong player or a weak player, but if he's a weaker player, he may view the 10 as a scare card to his ace. 
um, even though I probably would have bet the turn with a 10. Um, but he did have aces with jack blockers, and the fact that he called with the jack blockers I think makes it more likely he's a strong player. I'm going to make a questionable call here, but given such great pot odds and the fact that I think I beat the second player, okay, yeah. So I'm not really sure what anyone was doing there. Um, I'm Well, I understand what the uh, caller was doing, but I'm not sure why this guy was betting uh, king nine rather than just checking it down because he has a decent amount of showdown value against the hands that fold to his bet. ISO here with a half-decent hand. Oh, I didn't bet the turn with my flush, which is questionable, but I wasn't very comfortable betting twice. Uh, for this player to bet into the whole field, even though I block a deuce, I think he, you know, will somewhat often have a uh, have a, a set and now boat. You know, perhaps I could have just bet twice and folded to any further action. I think that might have been a little bit better here. But, you know, as it played out, I did induce some action on the river. But yeah, betting twice there, even though it's somewhat over revving my hand, uh, we can count on people to make some mistakes. Um, so that might be best. On the right table here, this is a pot that I would like to try to steal. Um, it's a board that does not hit anybody. And, you know, again, if I'm giving the player pool less credit, which I am, and I hope I'm not offending anybody, I, I do realize that there are a lot of strong regulars in this game. And probably some of these players where, you know, I'm playing pots with them are very strong regulars. But I do think that, you know, given that part of the player pool is weak, uh, you want to adjust to that, take it into account. Pretty questionable, obviously, by me there. Um, hand on the left was very standard. I didn't talk about it. Um, I thought about raising the flop, but I do think it looks very suspicious uh, if he is a strong player. Um, if he's a weak player or a strong player... See, if he's a weak player, raising the flop works out better because he's not going to hand read well. He's not going to you as a tough spot and also floats not going to work as well because he may not realize that I am supposed to have a, a good made hand here um, when I call flop uh, whereas a strong player I think will give me a lot of credit for a hand when I float and end up check folding the turn a weaker player might just bet I made a loose peel on the left table but again if people aren't squeezing which I did get squeezed and re-raised um, then you know I am going to fold here on the right but uh, if people aren't raising, I do think you can get away with button peels like that. And uh, I do feel comfortable folding the turn there. I think my flop call was a little bit ambitious. And I think if I wanted to bluff there, I should have just raised. Even though it does look suspicious, there's just not a whole lot he can do about it. So I do think that was a mistake. I've definitely made a couple mistakes, uh, given that I've been talking about so many other things. But... I wish there was a way for me to get, you know, to quickly get more familiar with the player pool here. And I guess the best way actually is in the comment section here. Uh, if you guys would talk to me about the player pool or the most common types of players you encounter. Uh, this is a... I have to fold that. I didn't want to. Um, but I think then I would be able to to comment more about how to adjust and perhaps in a, in a future essential video make a video like this again with a better idea of the player pool and, and putting my adjustments into action. So you'll notice that I'm kind of taking every opportunity to see bet. Again, if I expected a more aggressive, tough game, I'd be checking back more. Meanwhile, like, this guy's been in a lot of tables and he has a deep stack, and deep stacks are actually indications of aggressive players because they've clearly gotten money in. And raise and then talk about it. Blocking top set and top two pair is very important in finding hands to through bet bluff with on the flop, uh, especially because it's a hand that I don't really want to call with because it's not in great shape and I can't really call any turns. Uh, on the left table, this is questionable, but I am just going to bet call uh, unhappily. I think I just have enough immediate fold equity. Uh, on this seven turn, Yes, I could bet for protection and uh, like to not be bluffed, but it's questionable. Uh, especially if he's going to read into it correctly. I don't think I'm folding out any better hands. I think if he has a hand like ace-queen that he check-raised, he's going to call. But I don't think he has a lot of hands like ace-queen, unless it's ace-queen 5 or ace-queen 7. Or ace-queen 8-6, let's say. 
he does end up jamming, which is very interesting. I don't really like that sizing on a paired board when I'm repping a polarized range. I think he's actually better off calling uh, with a lot of his hands and potentially check raising river or having a small raising range. But uh, I don't think that I can. Uh, I don't think I can pay that off, unfortunately, because I would like to have seen what he had. But like I was saying, yeah, I'm taking a lot of continuation bet spots and a lot of uh, bet one check two spots, which I think is something that people do too often at higher stakes because people are getting good at taking advantage of it. But it's a very tough thing to take advantage of. And so until uh, people show me that they're going to be especially aggressive or um, defend properly in those spots, then uh, I am going to go ahead and continue betting and kind of protecting my hand and as Z would say, uh, stealing their equity. Check to me on the king. He leads into two players and then checks. I'm a little bit wary of running into a big hand here. I also don't need to protect against much, or sorry, there's not much I need to bluff out, nor do I need to protect against much. Uh, both of those things are true. And I actually just think he has king X or potentially queen queen. Potentially some kind of draw, but unfortunately I block all the draws, so I, I don't think I can pay this off. And I think I will wrap up the video here. As I said, I, I think we can actually get some interesting discussion going, and maybe even I can make a uh, small supplemental video to answer some of the questions brought up in the comments section. I think I might enjoy that more than typing out a bunch of, of answers, but... I guess the main points I wanted to get across are that adjusting to the types of players in your game will make the difference between you being, you know, a break-even player, a moderate winner, and a, a, a huge winner in these games. Uh, and I think that while you should always be working on your fundamentals and, and understanding hand reading and, and equities and things like that, because as you move up in stakes, which is the goal here, right? Uh, as you move up in stakes, you're going to need those skills. But in the meantime... You need to maximize the amount of money you make now so that you can move up sooner or give yourself the opportunity to move up sooner at least. And, you know, more importantly, even though as you move up, you encounter fewer recreational players and players with, uh, you know, tendencies that are very, that are very exploitable and, and allow you to make a lot of profit, you still run into some of them at, at all stakes. And you can even use, if you can get very good at the type of logic that allows you to properly adjust to mistakes that people are making. Um, you can use that same logic on, on strong opponents to adjust their tendencies, even if they're not strong enough to call them leaks per se. But I'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I always have fun making a, a live Zoom video, uh, although I, it does go a little bit fast, but I guess uh, that's why it's called Zoom. But thanks for watching. I will see you guys uh, next month, and I will see you guys in the comments section as well. This is Phil Galfond for RunOnWants.com. Take care, guys.